Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, thanks if you're tuning in. I am Tom Bushlack, and it's good to be with you. Sorry for the delay. This is actually my first time doing a Facebook Live, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of working to figure everything out. But uh, wanted to get in to our Centered and Purposeful Leader group uh, and share some thoughts and kind of get dialogue and conversation going. So um, great to be with you. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions or that you want to post in the chat. Still trying to figure out exactly how to uh, <laughs> how to manage all this while I go live. So I will uh, I'll do the best that I can. So um, what I wanted to do on this video was to explore a recurring theme that's been coming up in a lot of conversations I've been having recently. Um, and it's about the nature of power. And um, we all know that in order to be effective leaders, we have to exercise power. Uh, but I think we get a lot of mixed messages about what power is and what it looks like, what kind of person you have to be or the things you have to do to really exercise power, particularly in our culture right now. Um, so I would say that the predominant model in our culture of power is perhaps like a, a stereotypically male kind of aggressive use of power, kind of pushing our way through situations or um, trying to get what we want out of a situation. And I say stereotypically male, but I don't mean to imply that that, that is um, something that only men uh, struggle with. I think sometimes it affects women as well, feel like they have to live up to a certain kind of image of power. And uh, similarly, you can find men who are quite uh, tender and patient and compassionate. Uh, but it's more of like that stereotypical image. Uh, and we see it in business. We see it in sales. We see it in a lot of other places like that. Um, so let me start with an example that comes to mind when I think of the pressures on us as leaders to exercise this kind of aggressive power. Um, this is a colleague, a friend of mine who um, I worked with several years ago, and she's now the CFO of uh, one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. Uh, so she's moved up pretty high in leadership, but she told me a story one time of when she was first starting out and had been first moved into a leadership position in her organization. Um, and the person above her, who that she was kind of moving up into that spot after he moved into a different spot, had been one of those people who, you know, was pretty aggressive and demanding. And uh, so she thought, well, OK, now now that I'm in this realm, I have to exercise this same kind of power. And so what she uh, in one of the early days, uh, she got a report um, from somebody that reported to her that needed to be fixed. And she thought, all right, well, now I kind of have to do it this way. So she um, she called up the person kind of chewed him out, told him it had to be redone and resubmitted by the end of the day, and then like slammed the phone down. And it was interesting the way she described it was the very second the words were coming out of her mouth and she hung up the phone, she just kind of had this like blah kind of feeling uh, that she knew that that wasn't really in line with her power and integrity in the way that she wanted to experience it. Um, and she actually tells that story to people who work under her and with her uh, to kind of encourage them to, you know, trust their own way of thinking about and exercising power and that it doesn't have to look uh, the same way for, for every person. I mean, even if you think about some of the language that we use, especially in business, um, it's very aggressive, um, sometimes even violent. Uh, straight out of kind of, uh, you know, war imagery in the trenches. So you think about how often we talk about hitting our goals. What's your target audience? Um, what are some other ones? Uh, uh, we'll talk about um, well, that that strikes me in a particular way, or does that strike you uh, as right? Or you'll hear you'll hear you saying, you know, we're killing it. We're crushing the competition. You know, all of those things are pretty aggressive language. Um, and, uh, you know, it may be good or bad in and of itself, but it's just kind of something to tune into and notice as you go through your days, just how much our culture in business and in politics and in our public square is really influenced by a lot of that language. Um, so one of the questions I guess I want to pose is, um, you know, what what is the effect of living out of that 
sense or way of exercising power? What effect does that have on you as a leader? Um, what effect does it have on people around you? Uh, I, I apologize. I know there's a way that I should be able to see people submitting chats um, if I asked to, but I, I seem to not be able to figure that out right now. So um, <laughs> if you want to put something in the chat, go for it. Uh, I will have to try to figure that out next time I do this. Uh, so bear with me on the tech. Thank you. So um, what are the effects? So we all know, you know, the kind of basic challenges of being overwhelmed with stress and burnout and the kind of underlying frustration that we can sometimes feel um, when we know that we're maybe not feeling effective as a leader. We're not meeting the goals that we've set for us and for our team. Um, or not feeling aligned with our values, kind of like the example of my friend Liz, you know, had that experience of just feeling like, blah, this is not how I want to be in the world. So um, some of you perhaps tuning in might even have experiences where you feel like you have to silence your voice or disown your own authentic way of showing up in your power that might not fit more stereotypical models. And then you really maybe sometimes feel like you have to do that in order to make it or cut it as a leader. Um, so these, you know, these cultural messages that we that we get kind of uh, influence us even in ways we might not be aware of. So those are some of the um, uh, some of the sorry, I just got a, a message from somebody who's tuning in, who's going to give me a, a tip on how to how to run the messages. Um, so those are some of the kind of, you know, entry challenges. Uh, but if we kind of go a little bit deeper into what the effects of that are, um, we can think about how if we stay consistently and even sometimes we even hype ourselves up into being in this kind of hyper aggressive state, there are definitely long term consequences for our physical, mental and spiritual health. Um, so one of the simplest ones that I think people in our culture are aware of right now is that staying uh, in high stress, high energy states like that um, releases the the, hor the stress hormone, cortisol, as it's called sometimes. Um, and that long term elevated levels of that cortisol and that stress hormone can lead to inflammation um, and even potentially linked to heart disease later in life. Uh, some scientists think that the kind of typical type A personalities, um, you know, that tend to be more aggressive and, and controlling, um, are more likely to develop certain kinds of, of cancer. Um, they've kind of explored what the, the possibilities of that link in different ways. Uh, and then we also know that just the fatigue and the exhaustion uh, of always kind of pushing and driving like that and, and not giving ourselves a, a break to kind of reset and listen to what's going on in here. Um, can uh, can also make us more susceptible to things like anxiety or depression or even to addictive behaviors that we turn to to kind of manage the side effects of living in that constant state. Um, so those are some like health ways of thinking about it. We can also think about it in terms of um, relationships. So and that can be both personal and professional. So I've sort of seen firsthand, and I'm sure I've, I've done it myself, uh, that when we try to sort of aggressively force outcomes uh, with our team or as a, in a leadership role, that that creates resistance and resentment in your team. So an example that I experienced from a few years ago was um, I was working with, uh, I was kind of in the middle. So my supervisor uh, and I had to work on a plan to deliver some um, you know, news that the, the, my, my direct report did not want to hear. Um, and it was a difficult decision that had to be made at a lot of levels across the organization. And so we were delivering that information um, and kind of telling her what the decision had been made. Uh, and this, the person really broke down um, to the point of even crying at one point. And um, my supervisor sort of jumped in right at I, at the moment that I was sensing this person was most vulnerable and kind of needed, you know, some lifting up. We weren't going to change the outcome, but just to try to help her work through that process. Uh, and he just kind of came in with, well, this is what's been decided. 
uh, you know, this is our authority and you're just going to have to deal with it. And whew, you could just feel uh, that my the person that I was supervising just completely shut down. Um, and I know from follow up conversations that that damaged that relationship for years, perhaps even permanently, um, and really created a lot of, of resentment. And I think, you know, made it harder in the future to try to work with that person um, when we needed a more team kind of approach to certain situations that were coming up. So that was one example that uh, that I sort of witnessed of like, OK, I, you know, probably I would hope that I would respond uh, in a somewhat different way. Um, and notice that it doesn't mean backing down from a, a difficult decision. I mean, that that wasn't going to change. But how we interacted uh, without needing to be overly aggressive with this person, I think, could have made for a better situation going forward among our team. And we can also think about it, you know, in personal relationships. Um, we're more likely if we're in that sort of aggressive state all day, we're more likely to take that out um, on our partners, on our spouses, on our children, our kids, or maybe even on the dog or the cat when we get home. So, you know, those are some of the, the challenges that we might find ourselves if we feel like we have to pigeonhole ourselves into a certain model of what power and aggression looks like. So what's the alternative? Uh, that's kind of what I'm really interested in in a lot of the work that I do and, and even in the conversations that I hope we can facilitate in the um, our Centered and Purposeful Leadership group here. So the alternative doesn't mean giving up power or becoming weak or making yourself a doormat or, and it certainly doesn't mean giving up on striving towards like the big audacious goals that might, you know, are actually really important, I think, to hold as a leader. So what I've found is that centering into your power, which is the way I sort of think of it, um, helps you to access some deeper and more subtle sources of power that we actually miss out on when we try to force things to happen, when we um, kind of go at it with that, that driving force. Uh, there is a, uh, a famous book, I'm going to forget the author right now, um, called Power Versus Force. Uh, that's kind of popular in, in certain kind of spirituality and other realms. And um, I don't actually agree with everything that comes later in the book. But what I do agree with is the premise, which is there's a difference between power, that is the ability to effectively get things done, uh, you know, move towards our goals, do the things that need to happen, and force, which is kind of that next level up where we're really trying to maybe cram something forward or, or make it happen. So it doesn't mean giving up power. It just means stepping into a more subtle and I would argue more effective way of exercising power. Um, I wouldn't just argue it. I would say that I've seen it in my own experience and then a lot of people that I've worked with. And even just in observing the leaders that I most admire and how they get things done. Um, you don't have to sacrifice those sort of measure, measurable outcomes that we all need to pursue. I mean, we all have goals and numbers that we have to strive for in our work and in our business. Uh, but I would actually argue all day long that the long term outcomes that we want are always better when we step in and we learn how to tap into this kind of inner or centered power. So here's another example I wanted to throw out. This was a study done by a psychologist at Berkeley, I believe. His name is Dr. Keltner. Um, he wanted to study, you know, is being kind of the aggressive, dominant um, alpha male image, whether or not you're male, um, that image, is that really more effective? And he created this brilliant way to try to, um, to study this as a psychologist. So what he did is he thought, well, who are the people out there who are like the most um, known to be that that sort of you're, you're successful in this industry if you embody that. And he came up with hedge fund managers. So what he did is he found 101 hedge fund managers. He studied them for 10 years from 2005 to 2015. Um, 
each of these managers uh, managed somewhere between 40 million and a billion dollars in, I'm sorry, a trillion dollars in assets. Um, correct that, even more. So then what he did is he used these um, actual, he actually recorded these people with video, with their permission, of course, uh, as they went throughout their days. And he noted the ones who exhibited the most aggressive uh, kind of alpha male dominant behaviors. And then he grouped the participants based on these behaviors. And then uh, he studied the results of their hedge, their hedge funds over the course of that 10 years. And this is what is so fascinating. So what he found is that the people that had the most aggressive personality traits um, on, a, on an initial investment of a million dollars over 10 years, they made an average of 1.1 uh, million dollars or 15% less than the rest of the group of hedge fund managers who were not demonstrating that kind of forceful or more antisocial uh, way of going about their business. So uh, he showed that it's actually the numbers actually line up when people are willing to kind of do that more that more centered, um, that more pro-social way of going about their goals and objectives. So the interesting question, um, he couldn't necessarily prove why this was the case in this study, but I have two thoughts on this. Um, first, I just in general, on a, on a day-to-day -day level, we just don't make decisions well <laughs> when we're in hot or aggressive states. Uh, we tend to get clouded, we tend to get distracted and um, kind of uh, go after it. I had a situation recently with uh, a direct report who did something that, that ticked me off. Um, and I knew it was ticking me off at that kind of personal level. Um, and I wanted to go right into disciplinary action and all this and um, someone wiser and higher up the organization than me um, said, you know, why don't you just have a conversation with this person and think of it as like a coaching opportunity to say why you found that behavior problematic, to set expectations in the future. And then if it happens again, you've got a baseline to go back to and say, now we're gonna move into you know, more disciplinary action. Um, so I was grateful for that input from that person. Uh, and uh, the outcome so far has been positive. We haven't seen that behavior, that behavior come up again. Um, so, that's the first one. Um, I was in kind of a hot state and wanted to, to jump all over that. Um, a second reason that, that I think that, that this works better and gets better outcomes, um, despite all the stereotypes we have about people being highly successful and aggressive, um, you know, we all know that our successes depend upon those networks of trust and relationship that enable us to kind of move forward towards our goals and objectives. And that includes our team with the people we work with. Um, and it includes our relationship with clients or patients, whatever industry you're in, or students. Um, so I think that's the other reason that this works better uh, is that when we have that trust kind of going together, we're able to get better outcomes rather than just one person kind of uh, pushing or pulling everybody along. So. The key that I guess I would want to highlight in terms of my approach to this is I really believe that every leader needs a practice that brings you back to center on some level and allows you to move into the unknown and sit with it for a while. Now, that's difficult because it's really uncomfortable. When you are a leader, when I'm a leader, and there's a new situation that comes up and there's pressure to solve it. We want to just go at it right and and uh, and figure it out. And in and of it, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But uh, when we kind of throw ourselves at it, we tend to just draw upon the same old tools that we've always used. And we can't solve a problem with the same behaviors that created the problem in the first place. So this process of kind of coming back to center and pausing and listening to the deeper layers of, of wisdom and guidance that are happening, um, I think actually uh, allow us to, to sit with those challenges, but to allow new ideas and innovative solutions to emerge, maybe in one of those aha moments in the shower, 
uh, when we're a little more relaxed and maybe as part of a team discussion because we've built that trust and people are um, more willing to share their ideas at a, at a meeting um, to share something that maybe is novel and we don't know if it'll work. But uh, if we don't have that space to bring up those ideas, uh, then we can't explore them and discover them. Uh, so I think that that's, um, you know, it's a way to get us outside of our own blind spots. And we, we know that we all have them. There's nothing wrong with that per se. And, uh, but we can find some creative ways to not get stuck in those blind spots and to, to move forward. So it's counterintuitive, but one of the things that I actually um, teach people and coach people around is um, how they can kind of center in or I like to use the word surrender into difficult situations. And it's not something that you can just think, yeah, I guess I'll try it and just roll with it and, and have it start working right away. It really takes um, kind of a discipline and learning a, a method uh, and practicing it with the guidance of like a good teacher or mentor or, co or coach, excuse me. But I will say the outcomes, as I've seen, um, are absolutely worth it. Uh, people spend a lot less uh, energy, trying to force situations towards the outcome that they want or solutions, which frees up more energy for other things. And it frees up that space that I mentioned before for more innovative ideas to kind of emerge for them as a leader and for their team. Um, there's also, I think, something that's hard to put a value on, but I know a lot of people in the professional world right now are really hungry for and seeking. And it's this peace of mind that comes from leading both in a way that's effective. So, you know, you, you know, you're sort of moving towards your benchmarks and your goals and outcomes. Um, but you're also doing that in a way where you feel like you are in your authentic voice and you're acting with total integrity as you uh, go about that process. And while you do that, um, you also know or feel that sense of satisfaction that knows that you're you know, you're really empowering your team or the people that report to you. Um, or if you report up to someone, you're really doing the best to make them look good and contribute to the organization. Um, and as well as giving back to your clients and your community. So to me, that's kind of the, uh, the outcome, the payoff that I think a lot of people are, are looking for. So, um, that's kind of the, the thoughts that I wanted to share with you all for today. I'll leave you with, um, I do have a quote that I want to close with if you want to um, kind of uh, take in some wisdom from uh, some one of my favorite writers. But I also want to close by saying, um, if you're interested in exploring what this could look like for you, uh, this kind of, of centering into your power as a leadership tool, um, then here's what I want you to do. Uh, you can go right now to thomasjbushlack.com forward slash apply. Uh, and I think I can, um, oh yeah, here we go. I can type that right in. There you go. Uh, so if anybody wants to check that out, you can sign up for a free breakthrough session with me. And um, when you get, if you go to that page, when you get there, what you'll see is actually um, a calendar with some dates and times over the next few days where I'm available and you can sign up for one that works for you. After you select that, you will see a list of some questions. And those questions are just to help me get set up for the call and know a little bit more about you. Um, and that's it. I'll call you at the time for your breakthrough session. And I'll ask you some questions about kind of where you are, uh, what challenges you're facing as a leader. I'll ask you some questions about where you'd like to be, uh, and we'll we will come up together with a, a concrete plan for uh, for how you can get there. Um, so, if you're interested in that, go check it out, um, and I'll help you craft a plan to get there. And then, last thing I'll note is if you are enjoying this kind of content and the conversations that we're having in our group. Uh, just encourage you to invite other people that you think might benefit who are seeking to embody this this way of being and leading in the world as a force for uh, for good and for you know supporting each other. Um, part of the beauty of of this community is that we can 
you know, share our thoughts and ideas and inspire and, and motivate and support each other. So um, I'll leave you with that. I really appreciate everybody for, for tuning in. And I will uh, I'll look for ways to keep kind of sharing these little nuggets and thoughts and conversations as we go forward. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.